We have before us a series of relatively minor characters with, we hope, very large lessons that we can learn. Enoch. Well, we read there in Genesis 5 that Enoch walked with God about 5,000 years ago. Nevertheless, even though 5,000 years has gone past, he's very relevant to us today. God has written a very simple epitaph over Enoch, and it's there in Hebrews 11, verse 5. He had this witness born to him that he pleased God. Back in Genesis 5, we twice read, he walked with God. And that's something that's totally unique to only other, one other person besides Enoch. And that was Noah. They're the only two people in the Bible of whom it is said they walked with God. Quite a few walked before God, but those two walked with God. And that's quite an amazing nomination for them to be given. How much we would love to have such flattering summaries written by God about us, pleasing God, walking with God. And because of that, we can learn from what made Enoch that person that walked with God. Now, you and I know that we live in the days called in the Bible, the days of Noah. So what Jesus said, the days before his coming would be like the days of Noah. And they were the days which Enoch lived in. He saw the dramatic spiritual decline of the sons of God in the earth as gradually they defected across the lines to the sons of men. And we live in a very similar age as it was before the flood. You know, Jesus told us about the end times. He said, there are characteristics of every end times, whether it be the end of the kingdom of Judah, the AD 70, or the times that we live in. Jesus said, because iniquity shall abound, and you don't need to go very far to see how abounding iniquity is in our current world. Because iniquity shall abound, he said, the love of the many, and the definite articles there in the Greek, the love of the many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And soon after Enoch was taken away, there was an age in history where God says the hearts of men were only evil continually, where the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. Enoch's task was to witness against the early stages of what came to be such a terrible world that God had to take it away with a flood. Within two generations from Enoch's tenacious t testimony, there was only one family left to keep the way of the tree of life. And God moved to save them by a huge flood. You know, Peter says, as we well know, they were saved by water, not from the water. They were saved from annihilation by the water. And Enoch is the first prophet that we find in the Bible. The days he faced required faith, determination and a great deal of courage, as we're going to see, to keep standing up for the principles of God. And here was the first prophet sent to evil men that they might know the will of God concerning themselves. Now, who was he? His father's name was Jared. That means decline. Maybe this godly family saw around them the drift away from the things of God and they were sad about that and they named Jared decline. In the next generation, there was a son called, born called Enoch and that means dedicated. And we might suggest that this child gave them hope that the slide might be arrested. He was dedicated to God. Now the background we know very well to the times of Enoch. After the fall in the Garden of Eden, the earth divided into two very distinct seeds, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The sons of men, the line of Cain, they were the seed of the serpent. They were high achievers, city builders, and they soon developed trade, industry, music, and bred arrogant bullies like the Lamech we're going to read about in Genesis chapter 4. On the other side were the sons of God. Their line came down through Seth. They called themselves by the name of Yahweh. They were the seed of the woman, and they tried to think like God. And initially there was great hostility and separation between the two. God had predicted that and it came to pass, but it didn't last. 
For about 800 years, they kept away from each other. They had little association. But in the end, it was the expiring faith of the sons of God that led to a fatal association with the sons of men and their daughters. In these days, men lived to very great ages. You might have been astounded again when you read those verses back in Genesis 5, 962, 777, 860 odd. They were incredible ages. There were no language barriers in those days. So wisdom and learning multiplied and advanced greatly. It accumulated. You know, we have to keep training every new generation, every 40 or 50 years, in the same wisdom that the previous generation had. You imagine if you could accumulate that for 800 years. And the Bible says that flesh multiplied because few had died. They were remarkable times. Adam lived to see eight generations of his family. His son Seth lived to see Noah born. And I don't know if you got a handout of a chart. We did say there was a chart to be handed out, but if you didn't get it, we'll get it later on. But if you've got that little chart, very useful for tonight because you will see that virtually nobody had died down to the time of Enoch and certainly past that. So apart from the, perhaps the occasional murder like Abel, Generally, very few people had died of natural causes. 25% of the whole human history is in Genesis chapter 5. Now, the antagonism between the seeds came to a head in the seventh generation. Again, we take the words of Brother Thomas. The Sethites and the Cainites stood related to each other as the ecclesia of God and the world, or the woman and the serpent. A spirit of liberalism had arisen among the sons and daughters of Seth. You see, the the might of the serpent never changes. It's always consistent. It doesn't have to compromise. It's always the same. But the liberalism came from the sons of God as a result of an expiring faith. And it predisposed predisposed them to a fraternity or a mixed community with the Cainites, who, like their father, were religionists of a willful stamp. And could I say to you, I fear I see some of that happening today. We get down to the year 687 and Enoch had a son. And he called that son Methuselah. A very deliberate choice of name. You know, Enoch was a prophet, says Jude. And in the naming of his own son, he made a very dramatic prophecy because he gave him a very unusual name, Methuselah. And that name means when he is dead, it will come. The coming of divine judgment would come upon the earth at the very time that Methuselah died. And the coming of divine judgment was the major theme of Enoch's preaching right through his life. And now he had a walking witness. When he is dead, it shall come. And you can only imagine that Enoch and his family would have taken great care in the training of Methuselah. This man who would be this walking witness to his prophecy. It's quite ironic, but he also became the witness to the amazing long-suffering of God. Because Methuselah became the oldest man that's ever been recorded in the Bible. 969 years. And Peter says the long-suffering of God waited. And he grew older and older and older. Now I want you to come to the book of Jude because there's only really three places in the Bible where Enoch is mentioned directly and one of them's in Jude. Little prophecy just before Revelation. We were told that Enoch was a prophet. Enoch prophesied, says Jude. It gives you some idea of how challenging the conflict was. It's here in Jude because Jude foresaw in the ecclesia world of his time there would be a similar conflict between two styles of thinking. And he quotes Enoch as an example of how to witness against it. Now it says there in verse 14, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. The Bible does not waste words. The Bible gives us the keys to unlock the message that is there, to develop your own picture. That's a very telling comment, the seventh from Adam. Why does it say that? We can go back to Genesis 5 and count the generations. But no, God is saying, focus on the seventh generation. When you look across the other side at the sons of men, you come across Lamech. 
Now, can I just say, for those young, young amongst us, there are two Lamechs in Genesis 4 and 5, and there are two Enochs. So you've got to get the right ones. The Lamech of the sons of men that is in Genesis 4 was the seventh from Adam also. So what Jude is saying to us, have a look at the seventh generation. And there it is, the seventh son, seventh from Adam was also Lamech. So were they the same age? Probably not. The sons of God got a late start because of the murder of Abel. Lamech might have been perhaps even a hundred years older than Enoch was. But that doesn't really matter when you're living to 900 or so. You soon catch up. Now we have the speech of Enoch here recorded by Jude. Verse 14, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's a remarkable prophecy. Ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all. And you want to colour in in verse 15 and 16, or verse 15 particularly, the word all and the word ungodly. All the ungodly will be swept away. He castigates them by calling the ungodly four times in verse 15. Ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. And you get it again down in verse 18. There are ungodly lusts. So here are men that think nothing of God who ignore God completely. And Enoch predicted the day would come when Yahweh would judge them. Their arrogant speeches, we're going to see one in a moment in Genesis chapter 4, their pride, their deeds. Now we only have probably a precy of the whole speech of Enoch. But what we do note about it is it's absolutely uncompromising tone. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 4 and see there the hard speeches he was referring to. Because in Genesis chapter 4, the Bible gives you a snapshot of Lamech, his opponent in the seventh generation. This is quite significant because the words of Lamech are the only words that we have from 1,600 odd years of the sons of men. We don't have any other words from anybody who lived before the flood except Lamech on the side of the sons of men. So he's very typical. He must be an epitome of what they all stood for. Well, his name means the reducer. He certainly reduced the principles of God. And by the sound of him, he reduced few of his enemies as well. The first comment we read about Lamech is in verse 19 of chapter 4. And Lamech took him two wives. That was totally opposed to the principles of Genesis chapter 2, where God makes man and woman one flesh for life. He denied God's clear intentions about marriage. He was arrogant, violent and boastful. His children would lead the way in agriculture, industry and culture. Look what it says there about his children. Jabal, the father of such as dwell in tents and have cattle. So there is primary industry. Then you've got culture, those that handle the harp and the organ. Tubal Cain, an instructor in brass. There is industry. And then amazingly, we have a daughter. In all the the Genesis genealogies, that's the only daughter you get. And I think that's significant. Perhaps showed that women were pushing themselves forward even in those days. It wouldn't be very long before the Bible says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And maybe Neymar gives us some idea that this was coming. So there they were, the children of Lamech. But let's just go back to the speech of Lamech in verse 23. Here is the the boastful, proud speech that Enoch spoke about. Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken to my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. I'll give that to you as it literally is in the Hebrew. I will slay anyone who wounds me. 
even a young man who dares to hurt me. The NIV has, I will kill anyone who wounds me. So here's a man that says, don't you dare touch me because I can avenge myself. And he evokes then in verse 24 a 77-fold curse. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Seventy-seven times. That's obviously an allusion to Genesis 4 verse 15 where God said he would protect Cain sevenfold. He says, I can do it 77 times. I'm 11 times more powerful than God to avenge myself. You will be aware that there's a very interesting reference in Matthew chapter 18, verse 22, where Peter asked Jesus, how often shall I forgive my brother? And Jesus ups the stakes again. He says 70 times 7. So not 7, not 77, 70 times 7. Thus the Christ-like spirit of forgiveness, of not resisting evil, of saving others, is directly opposed to the spirit of the, of the personal vengeance which Lamech epitomises. And he's put there as a snapshot of how bad the sons of men had come by the time of the seventh generation. How could mankind have sunk so low in such a short time? Well... There's a principle in the Bible which we find in Ezekiel Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Gives us the reason how flesh can so easily degenerate. And I want you to think that now we're down to the year about 700 from Adam. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Because men think that time is just going on. Because they misread the patience and long suffering of God. Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, like Enoch, or sorry, like Lamech, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know it shall be well with them that fear God, like Enoch. And brethren and sisters, I'll say it again. We are coming and we are in the generation which the Bible calls the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. The tragedy is they are beginning to erode the faith of the sons of God. So there was the contrast in the seventh generation. But on what occasion could Enoch have had the opportunity to face up to Lamech in public and deliver that prophecy? You think about that. When could Enoch have faced Enoch, Enoch have faced up Lamech without getting himself killed on the spot? Well, I want you to come to the second of Peter chapter three. And if you've got that little chart of the patriarchs handy, that would be very good because you'll start to see that this is fulfilled in that chart. Again, Peter writing towards the end of an age, warning about what it's like at the end of an age. And again, he refers us to the danger that was experienced before the flood. Verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 3. Knowing this first, as we come in the last days, scoffers, and wasn't Lamech a scoffer, walking after their own lusts, certainly not walking with God, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now, just put that aside, because Enoch had said to Lamech, Yahweh cometh. For since the fathers fell asleep, note that, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. We're right down to seven, eight hundred away from Adam now. A long time from the creation. Everything's just going on like it always was. Now the speech you read in Jude seems to have been a very public speech. There was one occasion that the different seeds actually came together for a ceremony. It was an occasion when Lamech could not harm Enoch, no matter what he said. And it was the funeral of Adam. Adam was the first of the family heads to die. He was the father of all men. He died in the year 930. That's just 57 years before Enoch was translated. Everybody alive on earth was related to Adam. 
You imagine the crowd that came to that funeral. And perhaps Enoch, being the leader of the sons of God, of which Adam was a member, was given the task of speaking at the funeral of Adam. He would have impressed the sentence of Genesis 3, Dust thou art unto dust, thou shalt return. And everybody could now see that mortality was starting to bite. Around the grave would have been many older humans getting on to their 300, 400, 600, 700, some of them. Mortality was becoming obvious. And you imagine Enoch speaking of the coming judgment, pointing to Methuselah and saying, when he is dead, it shall come. We'd love to have all of Enoch's speech, wouldn't we? But looking Lamech in the eye and say, you ungodly sinners, you're going to go. After Adam's death, all the patriarchs whose ages we have began to fall off the perch with great rapidity. You go through that chart and see how they start to drop away of the ones we know about. And life expectancy starts to drop alarmingly. By Abraham, it was down to 200 years at the most. And soon after Adam Adam died, many of the other fathers of families began to die off rapidly. And that gives weight to what we have here in the second of Peter chapter 3. For since the fathers fell asleep. So these are words that were uttered first back in the days of Enoch's testimony. He told us, they said, that Yahweh cometh. Well, time's going on. Nothing's happening. And the fathers are dying off, but still nothing's happening. Things are continuing as they always were. And Peter goes on to say in verse 5, For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth out of the water. God brought the earth as we know it out of the water at creation. And then he submerged it again at the time of the flood. And men dis own that concept you bail up anyone on the street out there and ask a hundred people do they believe in the flood of Noah's time I guarantee most of them would say it's nothing more than fairy stories and God says people are willingly ignorant of that fact that it happened in the past and it will happen again and Peter tells us what these evil men were saying Now, you notice their timing in verse 3 and 4, since the fathers fell asleep. And that's why I suggest to you that this was a prophecy made at the funeral of Adam. And as the years went by, some people record Enoch's resounding words. And as the fathers died off, they mocked Enoch's prophecies for 726 years. Isn't that remarkable? It was another 726 years to the flood, but it came. But what of Enoch? You imagine what would happen if you stood up Lamech in public before all your relatives and told him he was an ungodly sinner that God would remove from the earth. Here's a man that says, I can avenge myself against anybody. So Enoch became a hunted man, and for 57 years... You can imagine how Lamech would have sought him out to avenge his public humiliation, hunting him down, seeking out his family. I believe Enoch's included in the words of Hebrews 11 verse 37. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, afflicted, destitute, tormented, wandering in deserts and the mountains and dens and caves of the earth. It would not have been nice to have to run away from Lamech all the time. And perhaps finally Lamech trapped him when he was at the age of 365. Maybe he had him cornered in a city somewhere, surrounded. And just as the net was closing on Enoch, God miraculously moved him from their grasp. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 5 and see what it says. You know, the Bible gives us some detail on what actually happened here because we have two records of Enoch's removal. In Genesis 5 and verse 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. You know, the Hebrew means therefore was not means he was not found. Make a note, if you like, of the identical Hebrew you find in Genesis 42 and verse 36 where Jacob is lamenting being separated from his sons. And he says, Joseph is not, 
Simeon is not. Now, he knew where Simeon was. He was not dead. He was in prison in Egypt. But he says, I can't get to him. I don't know how to find him. So there was a separation. So it says, Enoch was not, for God took him. Let's come across now to Hebrews chapter 11. Look at the other account of the removal of Enoch. And we put the two records together. Hebrews chapter 11, it says in verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this witness born to him, as it should be, that he pleased God. So here's the spirit summary in the New Testament of the same event. Translated there means he was transposed, he was changed in place, he was removed. And it says there, he was not found, same thing. That proves the meaning that we got, up, we got from Genesis chapter 5 is correct. He can't be found. You imagine their frustration, having surrounded him perhaps in a city somewhere. As they searched and searched and they knocked all the buildings down to try and find where he was hiding. And he was not found. And the reason he wasn't found was that God would not give Lamech and his kind the satisfaction of avenging themselves on Enoch. Now notice what it says there. Before he was translated, taken away, removed, he had this testimony, the RV has, he had this witness born to him. It, it appears to me that somehow God had put Enoch in, front in, in the face of the ungodly as an example, like he did with Job's friends. Have you considered my servant Job? Somewhere God made witness to Enoch and it brought a reaction from the, from the sons of men. God said to them, Enoch pleases me. And that divine commendation made him a target. But it also gave him the courage to continue. The negative reaction we got from Lamech and his kind was just what you expect. We see it in Cain when God acknowledged Abel. We see it in Job's friends who criticised Job. We see it in the Jews who sought the death of Jesus. When faithful men testify honestly the will of God, when their service to God is exemplary, the wicked of the earth don't like that and they seek to destroy them. And we note that this record says he was removed that he should not see death. In other words, those who wanted him dead would not have the satisfaction of putting him to death. But that left Methuselah. Removing Enoch left Methuselah now the one who would have to be the prophet to continue the witness. And nobody but nobody is going to touch him. He's a walking time bomb. When he is dead, it shall come. Are you going to put him to death? I don't think so. And there's no doubt that Methuselah and his son Lamech, different Lamech, helped Noah in the building of the ark. Methuselah, as I said, the example of the long-suffering of God, lived to the oldest age we have recorded in the Bible. He died in the year of the flood. He outlived his own son, Lamech, who died five years before the flood. You do wonder, don't you, what people thought of the ageing Methuselah as he got older and older and older. And you do wonder when he got in his 960s where he bypassed the oldest man that ever was recorded before that, whether a few of them might have thought about the prophecy of Enoch, when he is dead, it shall come. And it must have been very tragic for Methuselah and Noah going around trying to plead with the remaining sons of God to stay in the faith. But Methuselah died in the year of the flood and the rain started. Why did God say that he was pleased with Enoch? Well, Genesis says he walked with God. I want to just briefly think about this concept of walking with God. You know, Abraham walked before God. Walk before me and be thou perfect or complete, said God to Abraham. Likewise with Jacob, he said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me or shepherded me all the day long unto this day. 
So a lot of very faithful people have walked in God's sight. But it says of Enoch, he walked with God. And perhaps that means there was a personal relationship with the angels, as did Noah. What we do know is this, is that you can't walk with God unless you're on the same page. Amos 3 verse 3 says, Can two walk together unless they be agreed? So God and Enoch were on the same path, the same ideals, the same moral judgments. And walking with God gets harder and harder as the world goes further and further away from God. When the days of Noah come fully again with all their corruption and violence and godless thinking, it's not going to be easy to go on walking with God. But we have to try. Brethren and sisters, we're going to become increasingly unpopular popular, if we continue to witness against the moral decline, gay rights and easy divorce. We cannot afford to fall under the shadow of an age of tolerance in the areas that are offensive to God. We therefore must be prepared to continue to speak out for God's declared position on morals and doctrine. I have no doubt that Enoch probably offended some of his fellow sons of God who wanted peace with the sons of men. He would have been labelled an extremist, harsh and intolerant. And if time goes on, we can expect to be labelled as intolerant. Opposed to the new spirit of ecumenism. You know, the Pope last year made a very bold statement. He said, the churches are now a reconciled diversity. We're all getting on fine because we've stopped talking about doctrine. That's the spirit of toleration that this world promotes. We'll be labelled as discriminatory and not giving women total equal rights on everything. As homophobic, and that's going to be one of our next challenges. Outdated on moral values. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 says to us, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, redeeming the time because the days are evil. As bearers of the light, we are required to reprove the darkness. This means we have to be firm on doctrinal truth, prepared to challenge wrong beliefs, strong on morals as to what is right with God, and to sound a clear warning to the world we live in that God's judgments will surely come on wickedness. And that will not be a popular message because the world out there says, I have a right to be whatever I want to be. I want you to come to Psalm 1. Quite amazing that we find in Psalm 1 that we have a psalm that reflects the speech of Enoch. And you'd expect that because the book of Psalms is divided into five separate books matching the books of Moses. This is one of the Genesis Psalms, and so we find the first prophecy by Enoch referred to in Psalm 1. In verse 1, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. If you walk with God, you're not with the ungodly. And count up the ungodly. The same number of ungodlies in this Psalm that you got in Jude 4, in verse 15. Four times ungodly. Judgments falling on the wicked. Look at verse 5. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They won't be there. Psalm 37 says, You shall consider the place of the wicked, and it shall not be. It's all going to go. And Enoch passed on the truth to his family. It was his descendant Noah, who was the last righteous man that God chose to build the ark. Verse 6, Yahweh knoweth the way of the righteous and the way of the ungodly shall perish. So let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. There's just a psalm which just reflects that. Now back in Hebrews chapter 11, let's just see the rest of the story about Enoch. It's important to notice that verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 11 is primarily a commentary upon Enoch. It's attached to the story of Enoch. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So he pleased God. Well, how do you please God? There are two elements to that. 
to essentials. And Enoch was the walking example of these. First you believe that God exists. He walked with God. Like Moses, he saw the invisible God. Like Joseph, who would not sin against God. There has to be a God consciousness, first of all. Believe that God exists, believe who he is and what he stands for. And secondly, there is a reward. God makes promises. God keeps promises. God does have a plan. And we have to be convinced, like Enoch was, that he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. The struggle is worth it, brethren and sisters. Brother Thomas said, if God is anything, he must of necessity be everything to us. Believe that he exists and he rewards those who diligently seek him. Sometimes people are rewarded in this life, but not often. Our reward is the eternal one. And God has a special reward in store for his prophets. And bear in mind, apart from the illusions made by Adam and Eve, Enoch was the first prophet in the Bible. I want you to notice how God links the prophets. In Revelation 22 verse 9, we have this. Then he said to me, see thou do it not. This is when John tried to worship the angel. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them that worship, that keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Now there are two distinct classes there that are actually the same sort of people. What I want you to notice is when that angel speaks about how God views his servants, there is a distinct category who are the prophets. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets. That's why it says in Genesis that, that Enoch walked with Elohim. This angel very likely had been back there with Enoch. I'm one of you, he said to John. You're the last of the prophets. And Enoch was the first of the prophets. And we're all brethren in Christ. Quite remarkable, isn't it? In Revelation chapter 18, you know these verses. When God abolishes from the earth the Roman Catholic system, he says this, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. For in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of them that are slain upon the earth. And again we notice the special reward, the separation out of the, of the saints of the class of the prophets as a distinct group that God admires. And they're set apart. You know, it's just all the way through Revelation. Revelation 11, the time of the resurrection. The time of the dead that they should be judged. That thou shouldest give reward to thy servants, the prophets. Who's God most concerned to reward in the resurrection? Well, most of us come under the phrase small. But the prophets are right up there at the front, brethren and sisters. God is waiting in the resurrection to reward his prophets. And to the saints and to them that fear thy name, small and great. And I think that special categorization of the prophets in Revelation is something we need to take note of. God loves these people because of their spirit. You think about this. Being a faithful prophet of God was often a dangerous and unpopular task. You've got to go through the Bible to see what happened to the prophets. They were sworn, they were mocked, they were imprisoned, they were killed. They were always unpopular because the message was unpopular. It involved considerable self-sacrifice. We're going to look at Ezekiel later on this weekend, God willing. And see the self-sacrifice that he went through. The personal discomfort of Jeremiah in the dungeon. The imprisonment of Micaiah. The scorn, the derision and often the death that they suffered. Testifying to an unpopular message does take courage, brethren and sisters. God has not changed. And more and more, we're going to see the world's impact upon our ecclesias and there will be conflict within as that thinking gets into our midst. There is already much pressure today to moderate the clear principles of God that have been revealed in the Bible in order to meet human need or to accommodate science or to follow the wisdom of men or to be politically correct. There's already pressure on us in those areas. I do want you to come now to Revelation chapter 19. 
You know, right at the end of the Bible, Jesus comes back to this theme of the prophets and their spirit. And he says to those in Christ, you have a witness that you need to make, matching that of Enoch, of Jeremiah, of Ezekiel, of Isaiah, and all the other prophets that have gone before. In Revelation 19 and verse 10, and again, John is so overawed, he wants to worship this angel. I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, don't do that, for I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit, the mind, the attitude of prophecy. And we are required to witness to our Lord Jesus Christ that he rose from the dead, that he existed, that he will come back with mighty power, that he will come with all the saints to judge the wicked of the earth. And we need to be saying that, brethren and sisters. We need to keep up our, the strength of our comments and our witness. I drove past an ecclesial hall this week and this notice board says, what does the Bible say about money? And I thought, that's not really a very challenging title. We seem to have drifted away from titles like the Bible challenges Jehovah Witnesses or the deception of modern Pentecostalism. We just don't see those anymore. Maybe we think that we can attract people by toning down the strength of the message. That wasn't Enoch. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Say it and suffer the consequences. We have to fearlessly continue to set forth the words of God. And God will rescue us in the end. You know, Enoch was taken away and we will be too. In Isaiah 26, it says this. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut the door about thee. The chambers there means a bridal chamber. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. And before I'm again, when the time of trouble is broken out, God will remove us to safety. And they will seek for us, brethren and sisters. They'll be astounded by our sudden disappearance, but we will not be found either. They will search our homes, break into our halls, and perhaps for the first time read a few heralds. But we won't be found. In Enoch's case, God did not allow him to be taken and killed by the Lamech class, but removed him to a place of peace that he might live out his life. Being taken away does not mean that he is still alive. I just want to clarify this from the scriptures. There's been lots of suggestions where Enoch's gone. Some say he's gone to heaven. Some say he's still alive somewhere in the earth. Well, the Bible says quite a bit differently. It says these all died in faith. That includes Enoch at the end of Hebrews 11. And in the middle of Hebrews 11, it says these all died in faith. So they all died, including Enoch. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, says Paul. Enoch was between Adam and Moses. The wages of sin is death. Enoch, though we have no sins recorded, nevertheless was a human being that would have had sins. As in Adam, all die. He was in Adam. He would have died in Adam. But there's an epitaph over Enoch. I want you to come to Isaiah chapter 57. You know, we, we read passages in our daily readings. We come across them and you think, what's this doing there? Who's it referring to? Well, it's, I believe it's a commentary on the fact that God rescues his servants. And I think it's a direct reference to Enoch. Reading from the AV, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace, and they shall rest in their beds each one walking, there's Enoch, isn't it? Walking in his uprightness. Just look at that from a couple of other translations. This is Rotherham. The righteous one hath perished, and not a man hath taken it to heart. Nobody was convinced by the disappearance of Enoch. Yea, men of loving kindness have been withdrawn. No one considering that from the presence of calamity hath the righteous been withdrawn. He entered into peace. Let them rest upon their couches. Each one who went on a straight path. 
The NIV has, the righteous perish and no one ponders it in his heart. Devout men are taken away and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace and they find rest as they lie in death. And if that is about Enoch, it gives you one more indication that he certainly died at the end of his days. But that's telling us that his death or his removal changed none of the ungodly. They were still just the same and they got worse before the flood. He'd witnessed for 300 years and now God gave him rest. He'd been on the run for probably 57 years and God took him away that he might have peace in his older age. We don't know where God placed him, but Isaiah 57 indicates it was a place where he could be in rest for the rest of his life. And soon the flood came. Again, I can't put it any better than Brother Thomas puts it. The most beautiful words. Terrifyingly accurate. Thus were the mingled seed of Seth and Cain exterminated from the earth. Cain's race became utterly extinct. The ungodly are like chaff to be driven away. Only those of Seth remained who were upright in their generation who walked with God. The distinction of seeds was temporarily suspended. The generation of vipers was extinct. But here are the chillingly accurate words. But sin in the flesh survived. A principle destined in after times to produce the most hideous and terrible results. And what we know about how men have treated men down through the many centuries is certainly hideous results. Enoch's prophecy still awaits the day when Yahweh will come with 10,000 of his holy ones to once again wipe wickedness from the face of this earth. Let us have the courage of Enoch and not fear what men may think of us. The great tactic of the modern postmodern era is labelling. The minute you make any comment that doesn't fit the current avenue of thinking, you're labelled as misogynist or homophobic. And the thing they hate most about us, when I say hate, the thing that they find most offensive about us is that we believe there's only one absolute truth. There are not many truths. You do not create your, create your own truth. There's one saving truth and one only. And if time does go on much longer, we're going to become increasingly out of step with the age in which we live. We have to resolve to walk with God today. Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, calls himself in Revelation the faithful and true witness, the true witness, and says to us today, Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, or as Enoch might have expressed it, behold, Yahweh cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment. Brethren and sisters, these are challenging times. And we need to resolve that we will stand firm by the principles that God has outlined in his Bible and not be moved from them. Maybe you're thinking this study is a little bit negative. Well, Enoch lived in tough times, brethren and sisters, and we're going to do that as well. I trust the remainder of our characters we look at are going to be very inspiring because they show us how people survived, also in challenging times. But we need to take the warning of Enoch. Yahweh cometh with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment.